everybody, it's Susan Rashawn here, The Techie Mentor. I just want to take a moment to say thank you for stopping by my YouTube channel, The Virtual Assistant Tips, Tricks, and Advice channel, where I share all things virtual assistant every week with zero fluff, just the stuff that gets results. In this week's video, I want to talk to you about hiring clients. I see a lot of questions um, on social media about what to do uh, when it comes to interviewing clients, uh, what to do when it comes to hiring clients or onboarding clients. So I just wanted to talk to you today about some of, uh, I guess, my top 10, if you will, when it comes to hiring and onboarding clients. First off, I think the biggest thing that a lot of people overlook, and, and I did this too when I was first starting out because I just wanted clients so I could quit my soul-sucking job, I would um, work with any client that showed interest in working with me. And I learned very quickly that that was not, that's not the, a real way to do business. Um, especially because we're service professionals, we only wanna work with the people that are the right fit for us, or what I call your dream clients. But I know when we're starting out, we're hungry, we're passionate, we just wanna get that first client to really get our feet wet and experience what it's like to be a virtual assistant, or maybe, um, like me, you're just uh, wanting to get one step closer to escaping the cube farm. But I think the most important thing is when it comes to hiring clients or interviewing clients is to listen to your instincts, your gut, your source, whatever word you wanna put there, because it's going to help guide you to make the best decisions for you. So one of the things that I did was when I came up with my dream client profile, which I really recommend that everybody does, I mean, basically it's the traits are the types of people that you want to work with. So I really look more at traits than maybe some nitty gritty stuff that other people look at because to me the traits are most important. I'm not worried about if they're married or if they have kids or, or where they live. I'm worried about what if they're a micromanager because I don't do well with micromanagers. What if there's somebody that um, nitpicks my hours? I don't do well with that easier. And that either that kind of falls under micromanagement. So one of the things I invite you to do if you haven't done this already is grab a sheet of paper, divide it in half, and basically put what kind of traits you like and what kind of traits you don't when it comes to working with others. This is a relationship, so you wanna make sure that you're working with people that you enjoy working with. And I'm sure in our past, you can think of people that fit both sides of the belt, people that you really liked to work with and people that you didn't. Try to identify what were the traits about those people that you really liked or disliked. So for me, I just cut right to the chase and I only did a dislike list because <laughs> there was just so many things I could think of that I liked, but really it was easier for me to think of things that I didn't like. And here's the thing with the didn't like list is you don't want anything on that list when you're interviewing a client. And if you go against that, your gut's going to tell you that you're going against that. And every time I didn't listen to myself and I went against my instincts, I got bit in the butt because it wasn't a good fit. And, and you should not take clients just for money. And I know that we get desperate, but when you, when you fill a space with, with somebody who's not the right client with you, they're holding the space for the person that is. So when you have somebody that's not a good fit, let them go because what you're gonna find is your dream client can fill that spot, but they're not allowed to fill that spot if it's already filled, right? So it might be something you wanna try. I challenge you um, to make that list, and if you wanna share a little bit more about the list, please feel free to do so. You can do so below in, in comments. Um, the other thing I wanna to talk to you about is when it comes to actually interviewing clients, you should have a system in place for how they go about this. And, and I've put together a system, I call it my discovery session system. It's my system that I even use today to interview potential clients. It basically walks them through a series of, of questions. It also helps them set up the time that they can um, you know, book with me so I can have a session. Don't give away 30 minutes, don't give away an hour. Your time is your biggest asset, 15 minutes. You should be able to get what you need to know in 15 minutes. Now people always say, well, what do I ask? Well, my list is pretty short. I ask, um, how can I help you? That's what I ask on my, on my intake form, if you will. Um, and then I just ask for their information. And then when I get on the phone, I basically ask a series of very simple questions. I, and then I let the conversation drive what questions I ask next. I always say at the beginning of the, the call, uh, why don't you tell me a little bit about yourself and your business? And then I listen. 
and I, I, I try to pick up what I can from what they're telling me. I always ask, have you worked with a VA before? Because that's gonna tell me if they have trust issues, if they've been burned in the past by somebody that did them wrong. Then you know going in that you have maybe a trust issue that you're gonna have to overcome, not because of what you did, but because of what somebody else did. So I always ask that question. Um, I also ask any deadlines that they ha may have because that's important to me because I need to make sure I can meet whatever deadlines they have. And, you know, I just, again, focus on how can I help them. And then I use that to drive the conversation. So I'm very simple. I found that if you have this huge intake form with 30 questions, people aren't gonna fill it out. They don't have the time. Keep it simple. Only ask what you need to know to be able to get on the phone and have a conversation. Now, another thing you need to watch out for is if you get an email, LinkedIn is full of these right now, that says, um, hey, there's a position available, um, you know, send me your, your information, and then immediately you get a response that says you're hired. Nobody hires you if they haven't had a chance to interview you. So watch for red flags when it comes to scams. If they're asking you to pay for something up front, or they're gonna send you a check, or wire you money, no, that's not a, that's not a business, that's, not a, that's a scam. There's lots and lots of red flags, and I'll do another one on that, another video on that, but I just wanted to touch on that. The other thing I think it's real important for is a lot of people who come out of a job, when they go to hire somebody to help them in their business, they want to treat them like an employee, and that's a no-no, especially here in the United States. There's a very clear statute that the IRS writes about the difference between a subcontractor and an employee. Even if you're a, w, a 1099, you are not an employee, you are a subcontractor. And I really recommend that you do the research for wherever you're located. If you're here in the US like myself, take a look at the IRS's website and just type in irs.gov and then you can go in there and do employee versus subcontractor and it will give you a list of what is considered an employee, what's considered a subcontractor. When it comes to working with the IRS, as I said, you wanna make sure that you understand what the laws are for wherever you're located. So make sure you take a look at that and, and make sure you understand the differences between, because a lot of people wanna treat you like an employee because they don't know any different. So it's a learning opportunity. And so what I really recommend that you do is that you reach out to them and explain to them the difference or you give them, um, uh, you know, a link to look at. But you wanna be very careful about the difference between um, an employee and a contractor. So here in the US, again, if you're a 1099, a lot of people think you're an employee, but you're not. And if you're having some kind of, I don't wanna say argument, but disagreement, make sure that you give them the right information. Send them to the IRS if you're here in the United States, because that will tell them. They can't dictate your hours. Um, they can't, you know, they can't do a lot of things that an employee can do. And so make sure that you look into that because that's something that's really, really important. Um, a couple other things real quick. Um, don't discount your rate to get a client because that sets a bad expectation. Um, you're setting up an expectation that they, they can negotiate your rates with you and you don't wanna negotiate rates. Your rate is your rate is your rate, right? Don't lower your rate to get clients. Stick to your rate and maybe it's just because you're looking in the wrong place for clients. That's why nobody takes you up on what you want to charge. Where are you looking for clients? Another thing, don't work with anybody who's not your dream client. Because believe it or not, your rates attract the clients that you get. So take a look at your rates, take a look at where you're looking for clients. If you're on one of those eBay for people sites like Fiverr or Guru, then you're competing with others that are just looking for um, the most cheapest resource they can find, okay? and. I don't wanna be a cheap resource. I wanna go where clients are gonna pay me what I'm worth. And so maybe look at where are you going to get clients, right? Maybe you're fishing in the wrong pond. If you're fishing in a pond that's only looking for $15 an hour and you're charging 50, no wonder you can't find clients. Move to a pond where people will hire you and see the value that you bring to their business. So hopefully I've given you um, some ideas around you know, hiring clients. Make sure when you onboard clients too that you always get a signed agreement. Uh, very, very important. You might wanna send them a welcome packet that tells them how you work and then set up a kickoff call um, to kind of go over how you work and how your business is. Make sure they get a, a copy of your business policies document. So make sure that it's as professional as possible because that's gonna really set you apart from everybody else in the industry who are more hobbyist 
than professionals. And there's nothing wrong with being a hobbyist, right? But if you truly want to be a service professional, you need to act like one. You need to have those solid systems in place that are just rinse and repeat every single time. And sure, you may need to tweak them, but here's the thing, is that they're gonna serve as the basis of your business and they're gonna make you stand out even more. And if you're interested in learning more about um, a discovery session system, I invite you to take a look at the link below. You can check out my discovery system, session <laughs> system. It's the one that I use even today to interview potential clients. So I hope you found this video helpful or audio, depending if you're listening to video or audio. Um, please feel free to subscribe if you want to make sure that you don't miss an episode. They come out every week. Feel free to add any comments or questions below and I'll be happy to answer them. Thanks for your time and I'll see you next week.